This video was originally intended to be just one short video about all the protected devices together. But I soon realised that there is so much information to get over that one video on its own just won't be enough. Especially if you are new to the trade or on an apprentice scheme, you need to go through these devices in a way that improves your understanding and skills. So this will be part one of a short series and we will start with fuses. Some frequent comments have included things like what is a fuse? What does it do? What types of fuses are there? And are they interchangeable? And just what is the point of a fuse? It's just a glass tube with a bit of wire, isn't it? When we install a fuse, we are trying to achieve a certain response to faults in the circuit. We call this ADS, or Automatic Disconnection of Supply. If ADS has been correctly considered, then if something goes wrong in a circuit, if a significant fault develops, the fuse will operate or blow and automatically disconnect the supply before someone has an electric shock or the building catches fire. That is ADS in a nutshell. A fault occurs, the fuse blows automatically and disconnects the supply to that circuit. Keeping it very simple, and for now, just concentrating on a two-wire circuit, we have a circuit that supplies a water heater. The water heater draws close to 15 amps when in use and is protected, there's that word, protected, by a 15 amp fuse. 15 amps flows from the supply transformer either in the building or down the road somewhere. The 15 amps flows through the fuse to the water heater. At the water heater, the energy in the electricity is given up into the heating elements and this energy heats the water. More energy, switched on for longer and the water gets hotter. The electricity, the current, leaves the water heater having given up all its energy. The current now flows back to the supply transformer where it can be re-energised and repeat the whole process again. The de-energised electrons, the de-energised current, must return to the transformer. They must complete the circuit even though there is zero volts and no energy in them. Whatever current leaves the transformer must return to the transformer. It leaves as energised current in a domestic scenario as line current and there is energy in the electrons that can do useful work. After doing the work, the de-energised electrons flow back as neutral current in this situation. They do not simply disappear, they stay in the circuit, assuming there are no faults. At the transformer, they are re-energised and repeat the whole process again. We can measure the energy present by measuring the voltage. On the top leg of this drawing, 230 volts is present all along the line conductor and right up to the water heater. After the water heater, on the neutral conductor, there is zero volts back to the supply transformer. Let's say a fault occurs and a massive fault current surges through the water heater. Our 15 amp water heater is suddenly drawing 500 amps or more. What happens to the circuit? How does the protective device protect things? For tiny fractions of a second, 500 amps flows through the circuit. But 500 amps through a 15 amp fuse, it just isn't going to work. The fuse blows in thousands of a second and breaks the circuit. And all of a sudden, there's no current flow. The fuse, the protective device, has blown. The fusible link inside the fuse has melted and now there's a gap, a break in the circuit that prevents current flow. At 500 amps fault current, a 15 amp fuse is going to kneel down and die almost instantly, protecting people, protecting animals and protecting the property. Look at the voltages that are present now that the fuse has blown. There will be 230 volts present on one side of the fuse and zero volts on the other side. Be aware of this. Just because the fuse is blown and the circuit is dead does not mean that all the circuit is dead. There will still be 230 volts at certain points. When it comes to fuses, remember that a fuse breaks the circuit by melting the fuse wire or fuse element. And a fuse has no moving parts. This is a symbol for a fuse as used by many. The line through the centre 
indicating the fuse wire or fusible link. The wiring regulations will give ZS data for a limited range of fuses on table 41.4 as shown here. We have BS3036 rewirable fuses, BS88-2 and BS88-3 cartridge fuses, and the BS1362 plug top fuse. BS1361 cartridge fuses no longer appear in the tables, although they are still a very popular fuse, especially in older commercial and industrial installations. Just because it's not in the regs book doesn't mean that none exist. We can look at BS3036 rewirable fuses in a little more detail now. These were a very popular and versatile type of fuse around 80 years or so ago, and you will still come across them all the time. They preceded the now common cartridge fuse, the tube with a piece of wire. They are called semi-enclosed because the actual fuse element is not enclosed in a glass tube. It is partially enclosed by parts of the fuse carrier and base, but still exposed to the atmosphere. This one shows a ceramic tunnel through which the replacement fuse wire passes before being screwed down and secured into the brass pegs. With semi-enclosed fuses, the customer can rewire the fuse themselves and this is where the problems can begin. Will they choose the correct rating of fuse wire? Will they choose a larger size to stop the problem happening again? Or wrap the wire around two or three times just to be on the safe side? Which is actually the unsafe thing to do. You will also come across 1.5 and 2.5 copper conductor being used as a fuse wire or even a nail. Rewirable fuses to BS3036 must have a factor of 0.725 applied to the cable current rating because the fuse holder allows heat to escape from the fuse and we need heat to be in the fuse to melt it. It will therefore take longer for a BS3036 fuse to blow and we make allowance for this so as not to overheat the supply cables. Therefore, we must upgrade the cable ratings, IZ, to protect the cables by following regulation 433.1.202. Keeping things very simple in this video, a 15 amp fuse could be supplied by 1.5 twin and earth cables with 19 amps current capacity. But because this is a BS3036 rewirable fuse, we must choose a cable size that will take an increased current carrying capacity to allow for the increased time and heat required by the fuse wire. If we take the required amps and divide this by 0 0.725 as per the regs book, we'll find that the line cable must be able to pass 21 amps in order to comply with the regulations. In this simple example, we would choose to install 2.5 conductor with a clipped direct rating of 27 amps. And other environmental factors may also need to be taken into account. Cartridge fuses are very popular and we should look at these next. The fuse element in a cartridge fuse is an accurately blended alloy of different metals and elements and very accurately sized so that the required accuracy and repeatability can be achieved. Each size and type of fuse will have its own unique response to currents that flow through it, such as how quickly will they melt, will they react to motor startup surges etc. It's also easy to choose the correct size fuse, easy to change and they have much more accurate fusing. Once blown or operated, a cartridge fuse cannot be repaired. There will be a significant gap between the two end caps and current will not flow. Some fuses have a silica filling that limits the loss of heat from the fuse and also drops into the gap left by the blown element to stop any arcs running through the fuse, arc quenching. Each fuse will have its type and rating clearly marked. We've shown here a BS88-2 fuse and a BS88-3 fuse. They may look similar, some of them may even be a similar physical size, but their response to current overloads and their uses are very different. For example, BS88-2 is common in industrial applications, whereas you may find the Dash 3 type in domestic premises. 
There are different physical sizes to consider and different mounting styles. If you must visit the wholesaler for a replacement fuse, my advice is to always take the old fuse with you. So many things can be different. The mounting lugs can be in a different position, can have different pitch centres or no lugs or lugs offset by 180 degrees. How quickly will the fuse react? Do we need a 0 0.4 second reaction or will 5 seconds be required? Will the fuse tolerate the startup surges of large motors? Some fuses are fast reacting and are totally unsuitable for motor circuits. How will the fuse react to long and slow overload currents? Will the fuse tolerate high current spikes of minimal duration? And what is the current rating of the fuse? All these responses and characteristics depend on the size and shape of the fusible link, and especially the metals, the alloys and other materials that the link is made from. The link, the alloys, must melt in a certain way when the current exceeds a given value for a sufficient length of time. Making fuses is an accurate process and every fuse type is made differently. From very fine, almost hairs width wires for small currents or where a quick reaction is required to a much stouter fuse wire where a slower response or higher current rating is needed. For large currents, especially industrial sized machinery applications where hundreds of amps are common, the fusible alloys might be a shaped plate that is designed to give the required response to overloads. You may come across fast blow and slow blow fuses, but how do we know? A fast blow or quick blow fuse is designed to do just what it says. As soon as the current passing through it exceeds the rated value, then bang, it's gone, a fast reaction. These will generally be found in instrumentation panels or in your test meter where they are protecting delicate parts of the printed circuit board that can be easily damaged by an overload. We would not be installing fast blow fuses in ordinary electrical circuits where momentary spikes from switches are to be expected, or in motor circuits where startup surges are common. We would just have continual nuisance tripping. How can you remember that an F or AF fuse is quick blow? F is for fast, F is fast blow. It's as easy as that. Let's take a look at the opposite type of fuse, the slow blow fuse. These are designed to allow small temporary surges or overloads to have no effect on them. The fuse wire does not reach all the way through the glass tube. It stops about halfway, where it is joined to a spring by a blob of alloy, solder if you like, that keeps the two halves connected. If an overload current is detected, the alloy begins to heat up. When the alloy melts, the spring pulls the fuse apart, breaking the flow of current. But if the current returns to normal before this happens, the alloy blob re-solidifies and nothing happens. These fuses, the slow blow fuses, will have the letters AT or T on the casing. As a memory jogger, I think of the letter T as indicating time, going slowly. T for taking its time. And lastly, a little myth that's been circulating on some of the social media platforms recently, especially since electricity prices shot up. If I change the size of fuse, I will use less electricity. If I change the 13 amp fuse in my room heater for a 5 amp rating, I will save 8 amps. That's got to be good. But this is a totally illogical thought process. Changing the 13 amp plug top fuse to your 3 kilowatt room heater and installing a 5 amp fuse instead will be ok on the 1 kilowatt setting as this only needs 4 amps. But turning to the 2 kilowatt setting at 8.5 amps demand or the 3 kilowatt setting at 13 amps and now you are definitely saving electricity. You are definitely saving electricity because you have just blown the plug top fuse and now none of the heater settings work. No current is flowing through the room heater and nor will there be any current until you replace the fuse. A fuse cannot adjust the current that is flowing through it. All a fuse can do is to say that yes, I'm happy with the amount of current, or no, it's too much and I'm going to blow. If it's on, it's on. If it's blown, it's blown. And there we are. I hope you found this short video useful and informative. 
We've kept this first one very basic on purpose so that new learners and other trades might follow along. Fuses are just one type of protective device and over the next few weeks we will publish videos that look in more detail at these devices. Thank you for watching, it really is appreciated and we hope that you found this video useful. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you'll find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com. Don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics or one word into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.